As I began reflecting on the gospel this week, uh, a question came to my mind. What do you expect from a sermon? What are you listening for from the preacher? Whether we realize it or not, we all have sermon expectations. So what are yours? Do you expect that it will teach you something that you didn't already know? Or maybe that you would be inspired by a good story or that it would give you a memorable thought to take with you throughout the week? Do you expect that it will help you hear a a biblical passage in a, a new light? Do you expect that it might gently remind you about the ways that you have failed and then inundate you with the promises of forgiveness and good news? That way you can leave the service feeling uplifted. Maybe your expectations are a bit more fundamental, that the sermon shouldn't be boring, or that it should mention Jesus in some way, or that it definitely not mention money or politics. And above all else, keep it to 12 minutes. (laughs) 10 would be even better. Now, while there's some truth and some appropriateness to these expectations, the problem is that none of them align well with this Sunday's gospel. You see, the people in Nazareth had also had expectations of their hometown heroes for sermon. Last week, we heard the beginning of that sermon in which Jesus quotes Isaiah, and this week, we heard again that mic drop moment in which Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, it might have been okay if Jesus would have stopped right there, but things go downhill pretty quickly as he reminds the congregation again and again how God came to them and not us. Elijah doesn't help the poor and hungry widows of Israel, but instead he brings food to a widow from Sidon where they worship the false god Baal. And Elisha, he doesn't help the lepers of Israel, but rather a general of Israel's enemy, Naaman the Syrian. So what caused this sudden turn of favor? What made their adoration turn into murderous rage? Well, what if we put ourselves in their position for just a moment? For centuries now, we have been waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled. We've been told all our lives that we are special that we are God's chosen people. And Jesus begins by saying that today is the day of deliverance. Only just when we think it's our turn, when we think it's our moment, Jesus reminds us that God has this tendency, this tendency of showing up in ways and among people that we least expect. God shows mercy on those folks that we don't want God to show mercy to. And if God has done it before, well, God might just do it again. To put it differently, Jesus exposes their entitlement, their lack of love for their neighbors. I saw that this week as I broke one of my own rules and read the comments under an article about consumers' energies request that everyone keep their thermostats at 65 or less during this polar vortex. Now, most of the comments were people promising to do their part, but a few, a few were downright mean. Instead of saying nothing, they threatened to turn their heat up as high as it would go. They used profanity 
to express their disdain for consumers and for everybody else in the world. It's just a reminder that entitlement comes in all forms and among all ages. But the good news is, so does love. Love comes in many forms and among all ages. Love is the antidote to entitlement. Love helps us be selfless instead of selfish. As Paul says today, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So love. Love, it tastes like a meal shared with family and friends. Love sounds like an out-of-tune rendition of happy birthday. Love feels like a slightly colder house so that everyone can have heat and so that no one ends up going without on one of the coldest nights of the year. Love smells like a church full of flowers for a wedding or a funeral. Love looks like a church in small town Wisconsin this week that when their shelter reached capacity as the temperatures reached negative 50, they decided to hold an all-night prayer service so that everyone in town would have a warm place to go. These are just a few of the examples that come to mind. I'm sure if you gave it some thought, more would come to your mind. The thing is, we all know that real love is not easy. Sometimes it calls us out of our comfort zones as it did with Jeremiah in our first lesson. Sometimes love means admitting that we aren't more entitled to what we want than what our neighbors want. Sometimes it means making a sacrifice for the good of everyone else, even if they don't fully understand the depth, the cost of that sacrifice. And so we return to the people of Nazareth, people for whom Jesus would ultimately sacrifice his life, but who at the moment felt entitled to take it from him. This community wanted him to be their tailor-made prophet, their theologian in residence, who would read them scripture and tell them that God was on their side and that everything in their lives would be okay. He wasn't supposed to make waves. They didn't want him to challenge them. But sometimes love requires that we are challenged so that we can see the genuineness of the love in front of us. And Jesus, in his first sermon, he names the truth of God's love for all of us. In it, he calls out the hypocrisy and the entitlement of the people in front of him. And yet, in the face of rejection, he doesn't give up. He keeps on going through the crowds and ultimately to the cross. Because the power behind the cross is love. God's love for the world. And as much as the people of Nazareth didn't want to hear it, Jesus made it clear that the point of his preaching and of his life and death and resurrection, for that matter, is to ultimately draw us closer to God. So to return to that question of what do you expect in a sermon a response based on this Sunday's gospel could be the purpose of a sermon is to bring you closer to the true and living God. Richard Lisher, a Lutheran pastor and now retired professor of preaching at Duke Divinity School, put it this way. 
in his book, The End of Words. He writes, We have the high and dangerous calling of telling one last story in a world filled with lies. The story we tell must be true, true to the unfinished quality of human experience, true to the chaos, true to the church's rich life, but truest of all to the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the living one. Sure, sometimes a preacher might get inspired by the Spirit and share a memorable story. Sometimes you might learn something or see the text in a new and intriguing way. If he's got a stuffy nose from a week with the kids with no school, he might even keep it short. (laughs) But the main thing that you should get is a reminder of the story of God's love for you and for us all. Amen.